I will explain why I have the title for equal rights for, for parasites. But first, I just need to tell the LCA girls who used um, Giorgio as the coming attraction um, slide. I'm not sure if they realize what they actually um, select as a, as a topic. And Giorgio is a um, flagellated protozoan with which you get infected if you're drinking contaminated water and eventually causes severe abdominal discomfort. So yes, that is a parasite that you did and choose. The topic equal rights for parasites is not my wonderful title. In 1990, Donald Windsor um, wrote an article and he started it by saying an important issue in conservation biology is lying dormant. The term biodiversity seems to be used almost entirely for free living animals and plants. Parasites seems to be ignored or regarded as a threat to the conservation of endangered um, species. And I think this is background um, also sort of enforcing the fact that, that we need to look differently at parasites um, specifically. Now, just a little bit of textbook definition and even using the term parasite, parasitism is not 100% correct because there's so many um, different associations that we find amongst the um, parasitic world. But traditionally, it's defined as the intimate ecological relationship between two organisms in which one, obviously the parasite, lives at the expense of the other, the host, on which it depends for its nutritional and other um, requirements. Now, I need to steal also a little bit of, of the presentation that even Carter made um, two or three weeks ago on, on modern conservation, where he rightfully said that 96% of mammals on earth are us and our livestock, and the rest is 4% um, um, forms, forms the rest. But if you look at the entire animal um, kingdom, and depending on which classification you use, it's either 32 or 36 phyla. We see that invertebrates actually comprises 96% of all our biodiversity, and obviously including also a number of parasitic species. And us as humans only form 4% of the rest of the animals with, with backbone. So um, in, in the sense of the entire animal biodiversity, we not even uh, drop in, in the bucket. But if we're looking at parasitism, it is extremely common. In fact, there are more organisms that is in some kind of parasitic association with another organisms than we do find organism living completely um, free living. For us as humans, parasites has always been a, a negative connect, connect, um, connection with it. We can't, this is just it. Yes, they, we have some parasites that do threat our health and our conservation, wildlife conservation, but the majority of these parasitic species are in fact not really um, zoonotic um, at all. Also to understand the association that we as humans have with our parasites and why we think always badly of them is we need to understand how long have we been on planet Earth. Um, and that is actually not a very long time. So we could not really co-evolve with our so-called parasites and they also, also could not evolve with us. Now, if we look at fish, on the other hand, they have been around for about 400 million years. So the association between these uh, parasites or then the symbionts with the fish has really come a very, very long time. So a lot of these associations have been um, sorted out. Also, if we want to um, take in consideration the shape of fish, and interestingly, um, the, the, the entire body shape of, of the uh, um, fish have not even changed. So, um, when fish started evolving, it was in any case already, already a good um, body plan for them to also occupy a variety of, of habitats. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of um, other information and background concerning the specific interactions that we do find amongst parasites and um, from those that are facultative um, up until we find examples that are really true um, parasites um, at, uh, specifically. So in the case of the facultative parasitism, this is normally animals that are free living, but when they do come in contact with other life forms, they immediately become parasitic. And people have really misunderstanding on leeches because they most of the time feed on small invertebrates in the aquatic environments. But if they do come in contact with a vertebrate host, they can start feeding on the blood and they don't need a blood meal every day. They can actually sustain for a couple of days up to a couple of weeks if they had a proper um, blood meal. In Yaku, yes, there is going to belt us. This is an example of temporary parasitism because the adults does climb up from the fish host in order to lay the 
X on a, on a um, substrate. Now the picture on the left hand side, Argilus omblobleitis is one of the species that we collected in Yokovangu. And believe me, we have um, collected catfish for different projects. And up until now, we literally have two specimens because they don't occur in high numbers. They're not that um, prominent in, in, in the natural habitat. In the case of the Quinopeltis, the genus is endemic to the um, African continent. And interestingly, they also occur on the Mormirid, um, the family Mormiridae, and the uh, Mormirid is also endemic to the African um, continent. This is the male, and you can clearly see the um, legs three and four that are in close association with each other, and that is also where the copulatory structures are, and in this specimen is the, the female. In the case of the fish lice, this is one of the few parasites that actually has a common name. Excuse. In the case of the fish lice, we have bad um, ones that has been introduced with the common carp. In the case of Argulus japonicus, that does um, cause a serious problems in aquaculture as, as well as in fisheries. And another bad thing that came in with the carp is the anchor word Larnaea suprenasi. And you can see there at the bottom picture also, they uh, penetrate with the um, head area underneath the scales, and a lot of the time they does, um, do cause um, secondary infections as, as well. Moving over to periodic parasitisms, this is where some stages will be parasitic and the other stages will be free living. And a good example to use is in the case of the larval stages of freshwater mussels, which is referred to as Lugidia, where they attach to the gills of fish. And at some stage, they will fall off in the water, they will um, develop into the adult specimens, and then they will bury in the sand again. Now, this is also the way that the freshwater mussels will actually then disperse of their um, offspring by way of the fact that they can move to another spot um, via the gills of, of the fish. And then that other example is where the adult stages will be parasitic, as in the case of the parasitic um, copepods. They, what you see here is the egg sacs um, from which the Naupli um, stadium will, will hatch. It goes through um, seven to nine molting stages, depending on the, the species. And then the um, copulation will take the majority of the time, the males um, are not known because they're not parasitic. It's only the females that then move over into a permanent parasitic stage where they attach to the gill filaments of the fish. And rightfully, yes, they also feed on the blood of the fish. In the case of Lamprugliana, they don't have a common name. Um, they are also quite house specific, specific, so we can, um, this is the one that we found in the, in, on the um, gills of the cichlids, and the um, Lamprugliana ipsiety is the one that we found associated with the gills of the African pike, and the African pike is also a fish species endemic to the African um, continent. And just to stay with some of the parasitic crustaceans, they are a group that is, in, um, in, uh, in the aquaculture term, referred to as gill maggots. They are, um, it's one of the species, Ergacillus sebaldi, that does uh, um, cause serious problems in the freshwater um, industry and fisheries, and specifically in Norway. And you can just imagine if you have three things attached to your respiratory surfaces that eventually that can cause um, respiratory um, problems as well. This is the gills from a squeaker that we collected in Botswana. And you can literally see nearly each and every gill filament has a ergacillate attached to the filament. The white egg sacs means the um, eggs is not ready for development for hatching, but in those ones that's a bit darker blue, it means very, very soon the now piece will start hatching out and it will be released in the water um, immediately. So yes, gill maggots can be a problem. Then we have other examples where the um, parasitic uh, life cycle is also periodic. And this is always why I tell the students, they don't think it, but parasites can actually fly, they can crawl and they can swim. So there's a metagenesis with three living stages in the life cycle. And this is a typical example of a trematode life cycle where the adult worm occurs either in the mouth or in the digestive system of the host in order for the eggs to be released in the water immediately from which a mirasidium will hatch covered by tiny ciliums with which it will surge through the water, penetrates the first intermediate host, which is most of the time a snail. In the snail, it will develop further into the saccharia that will be shed again. The saccharia again has a tail, makes it possible for them to swim through the water where it will penetrate the fish. Now, this fish needs to be eaten by a piscivorous bird 
otherwise the life cycle will not continue. So as I've said, this is a typical life cycle of a trematode um, worm. To bring it a little bit closer, we can just remove the um, bird and replace it with a human. And this is how the trematode life cycle works in the case of um, uh, schistosome worms that causes um, bellagia. So again, um, the only difference is in the case of the schistosome worms is that you need a male and a female worm, where in most cases of the other trematode worms, they are hermaphroditic. But the same happens from your um, urinary tract. Um, the, the eggs will be released in the water and you can quite easily distinguish between the different species of the schistosome um, eggs. Metacidia match, penetrate the intermediate host, radia ontwikkels, sheds the cicada in the water and then it um, penetrates the human again. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Africa is known for its big five. You've just been introduced to number six because Bellagia is still a bit of a challenge in some of our river systems as well. Moving over to more permanent parasitisms, this means all stages in the life cycle will be parasitic, although different generations can occur in different hosts. In this case, the parasites are carried over by a vector, which can also be parasitic. And ladies and gentlemen, please meet number seven of the African continent, malaria, where the plasmodium is transferred via the um, saliva of the mucus, develops in human bloodstreams, and the moment the mosquito feeds again blood and it's from an infected person, the cycle goes on and on and on and on. And the reason why I'm saying meet number seven is regardless of all the wonderful project that has been going for so many years on malaria vaccination, malaria day, the spreading of, of nets, currently malaria stays one of the most dangerous parasitic diseases that we have in Africa and large areas of Asia as well. Each year, over 200 million new cases are globally being reported, and the majority of deaths occurs with children under the age of five. And, and Nigeria counts for about a quarter of all the malaria cases and deaths worldwide. Now, unfortunately, in 2020, virus number 19 overrules all the other work that has been done on a number of parasitic diseases. And a lot of these stuff had to sort of take the back seat um, with the challenges that we have with um, um, the COVID-19, um, obviously. Then just one or two other examples of per, um, permanent parasit parasites where all stages occur in or on the same host. is again our example of the freshwater mussels and those tiny black dots that you can see there are parasitic mites and the males, the females and the larval stages lives in the freshwater mussels where they obviously also will again feed on the um, gills and that's why it has a little bit of a red um, in the digestive system and it was a new species that we described a couple of years ago. And then lastly, um, Yosef will recognize this because this was part of his MSC study, is um, uh, in the case of the paradiplosome, um, they, they um, occur also on, on the gills of fish, it's a fluke. So what happens here is this is the one worm and it's hermaphroditic, so it has male and female organs, and this is the other worm. Cross-fertilization will um, take place between the, the two individuals. An egg will be released, and from the egg, a tiny larvae um, develops, which is known as the porpa larvae. Now, that larvae needs to find another individual, and then the interesting happens. They mate um, and fuse, com oh, yeah, they, um, fuse completely for the rest of their lives, and even their nervous system fuses completely, and they literally live as a Siamese twin for the rest of their lives. So, so death do our sport has a different meaning amongst the parasitic world as well. Then it's not the end of the story because big fleas have little fleas upon their backs to bite them. Little fleas has letter fleas and so at infinitum. This is examples where we literally have hyperparasitisms. And what you see here is a monogenian, a fluke, all those ones that you see there attached to a parasitic crustacean from the um, caligates that we find on, on the silver cock. So it's a parasite on a parasite on the fish. And in this case, what we have found, one of the other fish lice genera, Dolops ranarum, those, all those fluffy white things that you see there are sessile ciliates that attaches to the uh, parasite. And this is one of the um, fish lice that we found from the catfish. And at the bottom, Upistular maya, that's the head, and paras fruit in the uperculum, at the back, um, at Parkling at the back of the head of the fish, 
And then also what will be retrieved will be the abdomen with the egg sacs, but you can see again the, the white fluff of the sessile ciliates attaching to the parasitic crustacean as, as well. Now, earlier this year, a paper appeared by Colson and co-workers on a global parasite conservation plan. And they asked the question, why should we conserve parasites? Because they also have a high extinction rate, primarily because of climate change, and secondarily also because of the host species that can um, decline or is also disappearing. Now, if conservation efforts are supposed to conserve all species based on their intrinsic value, then parasite species should also be a target to, to be um, for, for conservation. And never, one never thought, thinks about this, but if the rhino goes extinct, these beautiful, colorful ticks will also go extinct. And we don't even know the exact role they play um, in the ecosystem. Now you're obviously wondering, where am I going with my blah, blah, blah? Well, we need to look at the parasite value and the role they play in the ecosystems by contributing to the biomass, the connectivity they have in the food webs, they do control the population of, of, of uh, numbers of species, and some of them definitely had a driving force with the evolution of other species. Work has been done, um, for instance, the intestinal worms that um, have the ability to accumulate, bioaccumulate heavy metals. And it has been estimated that in salt marsh ecosystems, the parasite biodiversity can concentrate up to 50% of the heavy metal pollutants in these um, systems. And the two pictures you see at the bottom, this is the diversity of nematode worms that we have found in the guts of squeakers in Botswana. It's about four or five species that we have described. And the picture on the right hand side is the urinary bladder of a catfish. And you can just see also there the high number of trematode worms that um, can live in the uh, urinary bladder of, of catfish. If parasites has untapped biomedical resources, and if they go extinct, it means the pharmaceutical benefit also goes extinct. Now, the ancient Egyptians already realized the importance of uridine in leeches, and it has been used in plastic surgery and other microsurgery, where the peptides in the proteins keeps the blood flowing around the wounds, and they are then used as a system in, in the healing process. So if, if this is not also really um, um, a force that we need to conserve them because we're going to lose um, pharmaceutical benefits, then we can actually just start giving up at all, which we cannot do. We know the most about parasite species that harm us, our domesticated animals, and frettled our wildlife, but literally it's a drop in the bucket of low, low, um, global parasites, and I include there something that some of you might have encountered, liver fluxes that you find in um, cattle, Ticks that, ticks that you will find on your cats and dogs, plasmodium, which causes a malaria, and then those brave enough to eat sushi, um, the anasarcus, which is actually also a huge problem in, in the Far East. We haven't discovered and described most of the um, bad parasites, but even the benign parasites, we have not even worked a lot on, on them. Even the known groups that do provide important ecosystem services, like in the case of parasit um, weight wops that are used um, as a pest control method as well. The role they play in their food webs, and sometimes we might not even understand exactly what is happening, like in the case of the hair worm that causes the cricket to jump in the water, where the cricket's then eaten by the um, trout, and that is the way the worm is also then being released again. There's another example there's actually numerous examples of how parasites change the behavior of their hosts in order for the life cycle to complete. This is an example of the trematode that occurs in the snails and um, coccinia, where the moment the snails are infected with the um, trematodes, the tentacles becomes to be much more colorful, like then they're more visible to predators, eaten up, and then the, the rest of the life cycle continues. And this is now we're back at the trematode life cycle we had earlier on. And this was also a project of one of our students where we found in Botswana in the case of the Mormyrids, but the nocturial fish, but we found the ones that were swimming around during the daytime had an infection of um, trematode worms on the um, um, brain. And sometimes they start insisting and then crawls also via the optic um, nerves and in, into the eyes of it. So obviously these fish are then eaten by the birds and then the life cycle will continue. So they literally, the, the trematodes change the behavior 
of the fish a little bit. Carlson and co-workers also in their article has um, 12 goals that they use around four themes to, to say, well, how, how can we go about with our parasite conservation plan? Obviously, data collection, risk assessment, practicing in conservation, and they are of the opinion that parasite conservation is now ready to, to, to start to jumping from premises um, into practice again. But what I want to focus a little bit on is because this is how Unlocking Nature also started, is the outreach and education. And they're asking the article, what needs to happen to move parasite conservation into mainstream fields within and outside the academia? And how might the public support parasite conservation? And how can we, as the academics, get people interested and enthusiastic about um, parasites, that they start also getting ownership of, of their parasites? To do this, we now need to go back to the basics. And Edward Wilson said, one of the oldest ideas in conservation biology is that saving species require naming them. So to name them makes it easier to identify them, to track them and to quant quantify them. It's also then a basic requirement the moment we start working with the public domain. So we have something that we can work with. But to date, a small number of parasites have been described and assigned scientific names and then a very few of them actually have common names, so, which also makes it then difficult to get the public excited about something with names that they um, struggle to pronounce. In the article, Carlson and have also realized that we can now go overboard and say we need to conserve each and every parasite, but there are cases of parasites that do cause um, health problems and its risks to humans, our well-being um, and our livelihood. And in the article, they focus uh, quite a lot on fisheries and our dom domestic animals specifically. They also recognize the, the fact that, uh, as I've said, we cannot go overboard and just conserve each and every um, parasite. They also admire the effort that has been going on towards the eradication and extinction of a number of parasites, like in the case of the guinea worm and some of the other lymphatic and filariasis and worms. Now, in this case, the free living copepot has the larval stages um, in the digestive system. And if you drink a little bit of contaminated water with the copepot, you will swallow it in your digestive system the moment it starts to digest these um, copepots as well. The microfilaria will crawl out and eventually it ends via your um, bloodstream underneath your skin. And then the adult worm starts making a little bit of a, a lesion and a wound in your body. And then that is the opening and the adult worm start releasing the microfilaria out of the water. And that is how the life cycle um, works. And just for a little bit for interest, the medical sign, it's not snakes that's cur curling around the, the serpent. It's actually the... Um, guinea worm because that is the way that guinea worms are, are removed from the body by slowly slowly winding the, the worm every day a little bit even more and more on a, a stick. So as academics, conservation practitioners and stakeholders start working together um, and advancing this parasite conservation, our efforts can then su be supported through resources and training and unfortunately with COVID, a number of the research funds um, for 20, um, 2020, as well as for 2021, has been severely cut because of more um, resources that needs to go into the um, COVID um, resource um, research as, as well. So um, at the same time, we need to share the benefits of parasites that we have in, in the ecological systems. Now, some of you might probably not agree with me, but yes, they are beautiful um, parasites as well. And thus, through um, public education and outreach, as well as citizen sciences, which is also actually a topic that has been dealt with earlier in some of the LCA, LCA talks, we can start building stronger local and global communities that support the entire um, parasite conservation um, effort. Now, to end off with, uh, interview that was done with Donald Windsor again in um, 2017 that he said yes but it seems like the idea um, parasites should be conserved as important regulators of bio, um, bio, biodiversity and biosphere is starting to gaining momentum but unfortunately at 83 I'm too old to see how this is playing out well I'm not 83 yet so it's my responsibility to keep on informing people and trying to convince people that yes, there's a sense of beauty amongst um, parasites. We can celebrate 
birth in parasites. And what you see in this picture is literally generation one, generation two, generation three um, in one birthing process that is taking place. If you spend time behind the microscope and you can observe it and see how these protozoans literally divide in less than an hour from one individual into two individuals, you experience the sequence of those events. Yes, there are brutal reality amongst the parasites as well. The black dot that you see there, that is actually the head of the parasitic crustaceans that burrows from the operculum towards the back of the eye of the fish and can cause blindness. We have a community of parasites um, in the guts of fish and not just the nematode worms. In the case of the squeakers, there's also ciliates in the guts and we um, as this theory that those ciliates actually assist the, um, the, the fish with the digestion process. There are some peculiar shapes and forms in the parasitic world and most of the time people are so glad and the, the moment they go to, for instance, the Kruger National Park and the experience um, the lion and the lioness in close association and with one another. What you see there at the bottom is actually, um, that's the female dolops um, ranarum and that is the male down there in the copulation process and he's very romantic, he's not transferring a pearl to her but what he's actually doing is transfer a sperm package to her, the spermatophore which she then carries with her and the moment she's ready to start laying the eggs, one by one she fertilizes the sperm um, from via her and spermatophore as well. So ladies and gentlemen, that is what I want to tell you and I'm sure you will agree with me Parasites need a place, they need to be conserved, and for sure they have rights. Okay. Um, these are from time to time when I late nights sometimes just browse through the television channels and you find some interesting documentaries on specialists, whether they are conductors of orchestras or brain surgeons. I always find it so encouraging and fascinating to listen to people, even if I do not understand everything they're saying, because they are specialists and they know what they are talking about. Listening to you tonight, I was really, really um, involved I try to learn as fast as I can, <laughs> and I enjoyed listening to what you brought to us tonight. And I want to thank you for that. Um, my, my, my sister always says, forget saving the rhino, save the bee. <laughs> yep. I, I, yep. I want to say uh, uh, emphasis on the parasites. And I know there's a lot of your colleagues on tonight, and for them it's probably some of the things you've said is general knowledge to them. Uh, but I also, again, I'm touched tonight by the complexity of the ecosystems and nature. And uh, we as humans sometimes just make it so simple. But your, uh, um, you are a worthy um, student of Wilson carrying it forward, not being 83 years old, <laughs> encouraging and energizing me for one to get to know more about this. Uh, Liesl van us, I'm going to ask everybody to unmute themselves and we are giving a round of applause for this very, very professional. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so Rod Cassidy will help me and let's start with questions and answers. Good evening, Marty Jasper. I can see you're ready to ask a question. We're putting you... Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're putting you uh, in, in the row. You can raise your hand if you wish. So let's see if there's any questions. You can ask your questions by either raising your hand or just going to participants and raise the electronic blue hand. Any questions, please? And Joseph Muller, just want to mention now, I know what you did your master's on, and that's very exciting. Um, I, uh, uh, I should go back to university to law, uh, also learn more, more about that. Neil Schiff, you have a question. Over to you, Neil. Thanks, Liesl. That was very okay. fascinating and opened a different world completely. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering, have you been infected? And how many times have you been infected? And what are the chances of being infected when you're working with the parasites? 
and okay. by what were you infected? <laughs> <laughs> no, I have no, I have not been infected um, with anything, and I'm not eating sushi, so I will not get infected with anything. <laughs> but now, on, on a serious note, um, if if you're working in 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 the water with with um, the the you had a lesion or something. Fun. And in the areas where there is, for instance, Bellagia in the water, you can get infected. So I have not been infected, but um, one of our um, former colleagues, he has been infected with Bellagia. And you must also understand if you're not the natural host of, of this, this parasite, then that then it, it, it becomes a problem. So if you get, for instance, infected with um, one of the Bellagias that is supposed to go to um, wildlife, then it, it will end up in your bloodstream and what I refer to it as trichobelagia. You can actually see the worms moving underneath your skin because then they also little get high wired. They don't up in your digestive system. They sort of lose track. So, so if you are infected, um, you, you're also your own immune system will actually pr protect you. But yes, you can get infected with Bellagia. And, and Bellagia is uh, seriously, even if you just go north of Pretoria, Nelspreit in that area, that water is still, um, uh, you, you have Bellagia in, in that water. And, and not just Bellagia from wildlife, from, from humans as well. But you must remember, somebody needs to urinate in the water or feces needs to be shed in the water for the eggs to be released. And then the snails needs to be in the water for the life cycle to continue. So if, if all the role players are not there, you will not be um, infected. So in short, no, I have not been infected with anything. Thank you for that, Liesl. <laughs> uh, well, you must come with us, Liesl. We can infect you with lots, yeah. And now, and now, and now, and you, and you are still going to have a talk, so yes. <laughs> uh, Pam Ellenberger wrote uh, uh, um, in the chat something very interesting. Imagine how big yep. the population would be without parasites. Thanks for a great presentation. Thanks, uh, Pam. Agree with that. Yep. Any other questions? Marty Asper. Of course. Where's Marty? Come on, my man. We can't go without your questions. Just accept our mute. Hey, Marty. How's it, guys? Thanks very much. Thanks, uh, Liesl, for a very interesting talk. Um, I especially chose my background bird for you for your talk on parasites um, because obviously they're eating um, ticks, but yes. even even their relationship with the um, animals that they live on, there's a bit of questions in terms of are they actually parasites or is it symbiotic? Symbiotic, yeah. It's it's. Uh, remember, all of us were parasites up until we were born because you nourish you, you got your nourishment um, from from your mother. So at some stage in even in the human life cycle, you were parasitic, and um, sometimes those um, children stay in your house until they're thirty, so they um, stay parasites for quite a long time. But in, you, you you you're quite right. In the case of of, of birds. Um, are they now parasites or they do a, they play a different role? And there's a lot of interesting things that uh, uh, involves for in cleaning some houses where you have um, in the marine environment um, um, shrimps that actually eats the parasitic copepods from the fish. So they clean the skin of, of the fish by eating on, on the, the um, parasitic isopods, just like the um, the birds then eat ticks um, from, from game and, and um, uh, cattle as, as well. So, so the studies are saying that they're actually causing often more damage to the animals. So they might eat ticks and whatever, but they actually open up the wounds that are almost um, healed and they're digging them open and they're sucking them and eating the blood. So the, yeah. other, the other part of the sort of, it's more of a statement and then a question afterwards. In a way, a parasitic relationship mm -hmm. where the host dies isn't actually a good isn't good for the parasite because it risks the survival of the parasite if the thing that it was living on um, has died. And yeah. then sort of with that in mind, are there any parasitic relationships that over time with evolution have actually become symbiotic relationships where both animals are benefiting or do, do they generally stay as parasitic? I mean, the, the sort of line between symbiotic and parasitic seems to be moving around a bit. Yes, it, it depends. Um, this, this, for instance, um, in, in, in the case of uh, um, reptiles, um, one of our colleagues from the Kwako campus, he works on blood parasites of reptiles. And it seems that each and every 
gecko and snake, whatever they collect, are infected with blood parasites. But we can't find a situation that the health of them are actually decreasing with the, with the presence of, of the blood parasites. If you look also at the presence of blood parasites, for instance, in birds, it has a much more uh, serious effect in, in the birds compared to what it has in the reptiles. So maybe then we need to backtrack now on the evolutionary development of how long have reptiles been around and the association as, as well as in the case of, of, of birds. So, so one needs to think bro more broadly on, on this association, and you, you're quite right. The, the, the line between literally a parasite and a symbiont, it, it's fusing. And that's why even in the parasite world, we don't like to use the term parasite. We would rather refer to it as a symbiotic relationship. And also, most of the time, we really don't understand the exact interaction. And another thing that and now I can just talk again from, from a fish, fish parasite perspective, we, term, we use the term that we refer to it as over dispersal. And the majority of these things really occurs in low numbers in nature. It's the moment we start messing around with the water and we start concentrating the fish, they get stressed up, the parasite sends it and then the numbers increases. So in a natural population, you will find fish, 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 low, low, no numbers, and then suddenly you'll find a fish with the mother load of parasites. And that's what, what we refer to as over dispersal. So, and that's why, although, as I've said it in the beginning, parasitism and the association is quite common, Believe me, you work for your parasites, and especially in the case for, for where we have endemic fish with the endemic um, and parasites. I hope I answered your question. Good. Yeah, uh, thank you, Janssen. I'm unmuting you, and then just also welcome to Aisha Mubara. Good to see you, Aisha. Janssen, over to you. Hi, me. I I used to be the brown broiki in our lab. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Give it a day. <laughs> no problem. So please, yes. I want to add. Yes. The lady that I'm busy with the whew, final two chapters now, getting there. <laughs> but there's a lady in our lab that's actually allergic to Anasarcus. Huh? Dead Anasarcus. Yes. Yeah. So she, when she gets close to the fish that's dead already, she starts sneezing and getting a rash and everything. Like, no. I feel. <laughs> no, oh, I, mean, I don't know. Yeah, oh, that's the fish you're working with is dead in any case that you guys get it. <laughs> yeah. And then the other thing I wanted to say is that um, I'm finding, I'm looking at the stock structure between West Coast and South Coast and the South Coast in three of the fish. So in total, I had like 384 fish and three of the fish from the South Coast. I had tentacularia. Huh? So yeah. only three of them. And the yeah. whole family in that three, like you don't find single, you find all of them together there. You, you can actually give a talk on the um, biological control of, of um, parasites on fish. <laughs> as soon as I finish the thesis. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Aisha. Thanks for joining. Yes. Jansen, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Liesl. Thank you for stimulating us. It was a wonderful talk. Um, opening new worlds, new thoughts. Just a question for the philosophers and Dave Pepler and uh, Chris Marais and Rod Cassidy, these kinds of uh, eco-philosophers, a question. As we speak of conservation, surely this brings into focus uh, a kind of environmental ethics issue here, where we're talking about those, in the, particularly in this Anthropocene kind of uh, lifetime that we live now, where things are very human centric. The whole world is very human centric and human interest. I mean, we're defining all other conservation issues in kind of human interest terms. Uh, <laughs> interestingly enough, uh, worldwide. Um, how do we get our heads around selecting only conserving those things that are good for humans, uh, particularly parasites, and uh, selecting against those that we don't particularly like? And how does that fit into any kind of philosophical thinking uh, from an ethical point of view? Hmm. Well, the clever gentleman can, can go ahead, but I think we can start by the moment we're accepting we're not the crown of creation and part of the environment, and then our attitude will start changing towards um, the rest of, of the biodiversity. And if we really can get people sensitive to know that there are really other animals than lions and elephants. 
and, and make them more sensitive to the entire biodiversity and the wonderful world we have around us. And, and, and I mean, if you just sit with, with the microscope, uh, Dave knows the um, Academy for Environmental Leadership where I was last week as well. And those um, children, the, the students there, I took microscopes along with them and then we fiddled around in the water and I also took slides with them. And just spending one afternoon with those students behind the microscopes, all of them in the end said, whoa, whoa, whoa. So if we can get people to go, whoa, then I think we already start winning something. And then um, th that will lead to the next thing that people really start taking ownership for, for everything and not just that something that is important for us as humans. 